So we're starting Parshat Vayakel, and the first five sources on this sheet all have one word in common. Um, so the first one, the first source here, these are all from this week's parsha. Right, we're talking about bringing, take from among you gifts to God. Anyone whose heart is so moved shall bring them gifts for, for Adonai, gold, silver, and copper. But I will warn you that English is not going to be very helpful for you in answering my first quiz question, which is what is the word that these all have in, in common? Next source. And let all among you who are skilled come and make all that Adonai has commanded. Yeah, El, can you read the next source for us? We're just going to go through all five of them, and then we'll go back and review. Moed, Ulechol Avodato, Ule Vigde Hakodesh, Vayavou Hanashim Al Hanashim, Kol Nediv Lev, Heviu Chach, Vanezem Vetabat Vehumaz, Kol Kli Zahav, Vehol Ish Asher Hinif, Tnufat Zahav Ladonai. And everyone who excelled in ability and everyone whose spirit was moved came bringing to Adonai an offering for the work of the tent of meeting and for all its service and for the sacral vestments. Men and women, all whose hearts moved them, all who would make an elevation offering of gold to Adonai, came bringing bro brooches, earrings, rings, and pendants, gold objects of all kinds. Thank you. Uh, and can we have a reader for the, the fourth one? It's written in very fine print here, Exodus 3529. Or actually, I'll just jump in for this, and then we'll get into discussion. So, kol ish ve'isha asher nadav libam oto lavi lechol hamalacha asher tzivar onai laasot v'yad Moshe heviu v'nei Yisrael nedava ladonai. Thus, the Israelites, all the men and women whose hearts moved them to bring anything for the work that Adonai through Moses had commanded to be done, brought it as a free will offering to Adonai. So we're clearly in this moment of building the Mishkan, and uh, and everyone is bringing things. They are, they are bringing their skills, and they're bringing their beautiful belongings. Has anyone picked out what the Hebrew word is that's uh, consistent across all of these? Yeah. Yavo, yes, that's true. Um, and, and, and live. So Nadiv is across some of them, but not all of them. Um, right. So Nadav is in the last one, but Yavi is not. Um, Joey, do you mind using the microphone? Uh, Tiruma and Tirumat. Also a common one, not in all of them, but in okay. many of them. Yep. Um, so we're going to go back to to Marshall's point of Lev. Um, it's too bad Rabbi Klickfeld's not here when we're speaking about his son's name. Uh, but, um, but Lev is in each of these, right? In the first one, we have it with kol nadiv lev yevi eha, everyone who's, this translation says, heart is so moved. Nadiv uh, means generous, right? So everyone who is generous of heart. Um, but then in the next verse, uh, which is five verses later, we're going from Exodus 35.5 to Exodus 35.10. V'chol uh, chacham lev, all among you who are skilled. So chacham lev is, is of wise heart as literal translation. Um, then we, have, we go back to, uh, gen we say uh, in the next verse, v'yavo'u kol ish asher nesa'u libo. Right, so now we have a different usage of lev, right, that he essentially lifted up his heart is the literal translation of this. And the JPS translation is excelled in ability, 
So we have heart being used in several different, in euphemisms for different things, right? We have skill in two different forms and generosity. And then in the same verse, it also says, asher nadva rucho. So in this case, it's talking about generosity, but instead of saying nadiv lev, generosity of heart, it says nadva rucho, like generosity of his spirit, right? So we have several different versions of of heart and spirit and different ways of saying skill and different ways of saying generosity. Um, why, how do you think of heart in American parlance um, kind of euphemistically? If we talk about what's, what does the heart service? And Marshall, I see your hand if we can get the microphone down. Well, in English parlance, it's thought of as the seat of emotion, but in biblical Hebrew, it's the sort a seat of intelligence, I believe. Yes, yes, exactly. So um, we need to make sure that we keep this in mind when we're thinking about generosity, especially when we're talking about Nadiv Lev, right? Because when we're talking about Chacham Lev, that this is the wisdom of the center of the intellect, and that that is the way of describing somebody's somebody being very skilled in something, it makes sense, right? That lev would be something for intelligence, skill. They're very good at what they at their craft. But what does it mean to have the center of the intellect be described as the center of generosity, mm. right? Because often we think of generosity as something that comes from the heart in our modern American way of saying it, right? Something that comes from the heart, like emotionally, that we have an open heart and we give freely. Um, so we're not actually going to answer that question right now, um, but we're going to continue onwards and just hold that question in our minds. Um, all the ways that people are coming to offer their skills and their belongings, how would you describe the model of generosity? We're skipping down. There's a, a set of questions on the bottom of the third page, top of the fourth. How would you describe the model of generosity that's being proposed here? Um, the large, uh, relatively large uh, set of psukim above this question essentially says that people were giving so much that it was too much, and Moses had to say, stop. <laughs> like, problem at Beth huge problem at Bethlehem. People are too giving. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, that God willing, everyone should be blessed with such a problem. Um, so they're giving so much that Moses says, you must stop. How would you describe this model of generosity? Voluntary. Voluntary. Okay. Note. Um, note also the questions on the top of page four. It got split. Um, universally applicable or only for Jews? Because we're building the Mishkan here. So what does that mean? And does it matter to which cause one gives? But we'll hold that for a sec. Is this universal or is this Jewish specific giving? Sorry, Joel? Uh, not universal. Mishkan. Nothing to do with other nothing to do with other people. So it isn't like the, the Red Cross that would help anybody if there's a tragedy. Mm -hmm. Why is the Mishkan specific to Jews? I'm sorry? Why is the Mishkan specific to Jews? Because of their relationship to God. And this is, so, it says, Vasuli Mishkan Mishachanti Betocham. They make the Mishkan for me and I will dwell with them. So it has to do with our being close to God. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Does anyone have a different take on whether the Mishkan is just for Jews or a way of connecting with God is just for Jews? Can we pass the mic back? Or You know, they just screwed up with the calf, right? So Jewish guilt now looks like it's in operation. <laughs> You're all ahead of me and providing all the segues before we get there. So let's jump forward. But I didn't even uh, choose to read ahead. <laughs> you didn't? Did you really not read no, ahead? No, I didn't choose. Okay, well, wait, leave the mic there and go ahead and read. Um, so oh. this next pasuk or set of sukim is, uh, is not from this week's parsha. It's from the parsha we read this morning, which now would be last week's parsha. 
We're up to what, what, where we are. Uh, Aaron said to them, you men take okay. off gold rings. <clears throat> Aaron said to them, you men, take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. And all the people took off the gold rings that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. Then he took from them and cast in a mold and made it into a molten calf. And they, ex and they exclaimed, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Thank you. Is this a model of generosity? No. Say more. The husband. Aaron is demanding of them that they give their gold, right, as in response to the anxiety that they expressed and, uh, and taking from them. Did God command that the Israelites also give of their own skill and, and belongings for the Mishkan? No, there were, for the Mishkan? Yeah. No. Did, did, God, did God command, right, that the Mishkan be built of beautiful things from the community? He did not, he did not command. Okay. Okay. Alan? This raises just a very interesting question. If all the gold that they had in their ears and everything else went to the to the to the uh, the golden calf, what gold was left to go to the Mishkan? And that lays, mm -hmm. you know, Ain Mukdamu Harbat Torah and some say maybe earlier and what have you, but it's um it's it's an it's a, well but just the ears and the rings, what other gold you know, what other gold did they have if they were making what was going to be supposedly their image of God that Aaron was doing and it's amazing. Aaron, you know, the rabbis do everything they can to make Aaron look good. But when you look at the plain shot, it looks like he wasn't so good in what he was doing and trying to get this done. But Aaron, Aaron didn't oh, say, bring me all your gold. Yeah, he didn't say, no, he just said, bring me your, bring me your gold. He, yeah. yeah, so Aaron said, only bring uh, me your rings and your I gold. Okay, one rings. second. Sandra and then Irv. Bring whatever you want, yeah. Right. Right. So, um, Right, exactly. And and that idea that, that God commanded that the Mishkan be brought and gave instructions, very clear instructions, but then each person brought of their own free will. Um, I'll actually invite you to check back at the, uh, the Pasuk at the bottom of page two. Um, Thus the Israelites, all the men and women whose hearts moved them to bring anything for the work that Adonai through Moses had commanded to be done, brought it as a free will offering to Adonai. Right, so this is, so it's, Exactly what you're saying is that it is both commanded and free will. But how do we hold all of that? But Irv, you were going to say something earlier. Yeah, I think Aaron, um, I, I don't know where I picked this up, but I read it somewhere, uh, I, that Aaron was making the golden calf as a way of dealing with the people's fears of everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was really like a diversion of, uh, you know, um, the idea of having him do something they probably didn't want to do to keep them, keep them focused on, on uh, staying together rather than just saying, oh, boy, Moses is gone. We're left here to starve in the desert, right? That's mm -hmm. the situation they were in before the golden calf. Mm -hmm. The golden calf was, my understanding, Aaron, was it was a good thing because it was like so, a way that kept the people from doing something worse. Didn't they kill her who was trying to stop them from doing something? Also, the, the mob before the golden calf. Yeah, there. Yes, we're going to put that story confused, aside. So you could straighten it out for me. <laughs> um, what I want to pick out from what you're saying is um, that Aaron was assuaging the anxiety of the Israelites, right? Like that's how the, the rabbinic understanding is that Aaron was kind of stuck and didn't have any good option of what to do in that moment, right? So that 
what undergirds that comment is that intentionality matters when it comes to generosity, right? That like we don't view this as an act of generosity of the heart, of the soul, of the mind, because it's actually a giving out of anxiety, right? It, it's a giving out of a negative sp mental space, and therefore we don't hold that up as a model. Um, would, are there any other comments before we move forward to this idea of how guilty they were feeling in this moment? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So she's saying you <coughs> want the Mishkan to be built from a place of, you know, guilt, anxiety, obligation, or should it? It should be holier that it would be built from a place of love and free will and and love for God. Yeah. Yes, Fran. And oh, sorry, Joey, and then Fran. Yeah. Well, when it, the golden calf, that wasn't. Those was just beyond simple uh, anxiety or whatever. It's blasphemy. It is blasphemy. Right. Right, so we have a problem of both intentionality and result, right? right. Means, neither means nor end are justified there. Right. Yes. Um, okay. Okay, Fran, are you comfortable with the microphone? Or you? I'm happy to do whatever. Okay, great, okay. sounds good. <laughs> when when in generous the policy for generous is about the <coughs> and that was Mm -hmm. I'm just going to repeat that for the folks on Zoom so okay. that they can hear it. So you were saying that they that some days you feel more generous and some days you feel less generous, and like that's just being human. Yes. And it would be a little preposterous to assume or ask that everybody feels maximally generous right when we ask them to, right? Well, and. Miracle of this moment that everyone brings yeah, their that, of their pure yeah. heart. Yes. Yes. And you can inspire with that as a Yes. Yeah, definitely aspirational. Yes, Joel and then we're gonna oh Joel and Marshall and then we'll move on. As far as I know, in the days of the Torah there was no internet and no email. And we are in such a different position 
We get so many emails asking us for money, and all of these are good causes. There's an earthquake in Turkey, you know, can we help? We have a need in our own synagogue, can we help? There's Jews who are, are hungry, there's Holocaust. We get 20, 30, 40 emails a week asking us for money, and I'm not even mentioning the political ads asking to support candidates. So it's, it's such a different kind of thing where you had one function there, one thing to give to, and now when you talk about generosity, you have to ask, but, but to what extent do I give something for everybody that I don't have any money left for myself? So it's, it's, it's a much more of a conundrum, I think, today. Yes, yes. It was, while you pass the mic, I'll just say one of the most uh, powerful uh, experiences of generosity that I've ever received was when I was backpacking the Appalachian Trail, and people would not be asked. They would just come out to trailheads and cook us meals or leave boxes full of sodas or whatever it was. And it's called trail magic. Like there's a term and a practice of this all along the, the AT. It was so cool. <laughs> and you know, it was, it, it, me yeah. I mean, it does involve sleeping in the woods for six months, but that's a different story. Um, so, but you know, the, this idea of when people give without- Shava? Yes. Uh, you said that I just have to know, which direction did you go? I went northbound. And what months? I actually, the anniversary of my uh, start date was four days ago, uh, March 7th. Oh, so nice. Because they also, you know, people would let you take showers. People would leave boots in libraries. I, I mean, I get worked up about the trail, but I'll stop now. We should talk later. <laughs> Marshall? Uh, actually, uh, Baxter and Rosenblatt from the conservative yeshiva sort of answered Alan's question about if they donated all the if they uh, donated all the money for the Mishkan, how did they have enough for the golden cap? And so he, he taught, he, she mentioned in Sifrei, uh, that, which is rabbinic commentary on the book of, I think it's Devarim. Uh, uh, no, Sifrei is Leviticus. Oh, oh Leviticus, okay. Uh, she referenced here Sifrei, but uh, that basically one of the places that B'nai Yisrael were in before crossing over was called Dizahav. Enough, enough gold. So they had both money for building the Mishkan and also for creating the Egel Hazahab. That's great. So we're, we're tight on time. Can you say it quickly? Okay. That is a great point, that these people probably would not have had much, and, and how um, powerful it must have been to be able to give for the first time. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, there's an interesting conversation on what, what Abdu meant in, in Egypt, but um, it is such an empowering way to enter a relationship with God, right? That you, that you have something to give God, as well as all everything that they're receiving from God. You know, everything that they received is, um, it is compelling. I appreciate that point. So I just want to hold that point that we had earlier around intentionality matters and where things come from matters. I'm not going to read this full text, but I will invite you to read it later. Um, there's an excerpt from Arthur Green, Rabbi Arthur Green's uh, translation of the Svatimet um, on the bottom of, two, three, four, bottom of page four, top of page five. Um, where he talks about how uh, after the sin of the golden calf, they needed to give this offering. And he actually, for, I would think that this would be a guilt offering, right? That like, they're, they're looking to expiate themselves of this horrible, I mean, really maximal sin they've just committed. Um, and instead, Rabbi Green says, by the act of giving, they brought forth their own inner generosity their longing and attachment so that they were able to draw the Shechina into their midst. And that's why the sanctuary is called the Tabernacle of Witness. It bears witness that the Shechina dwells in Israel. Mm -hmm. So this ties actually really well to what you were just saying, that there's, um, that it wasn't coming from a low place where they're not groveling before God. They're actually raising themselves up and saying, like, making themselves worthy of this relationship with God and making themselves worthy of having a Mishkan of God in their midst. 
Um, we're running out of time and uh, I was talking to Alan beforehand about whether or not I had too many sources and I think this answers the question. Uh, but uh, the, we're, we're gonna conclude here. The rabbinic material that follows, um, if you wanna take this home and look through it later, is, um, is rabbinic discussion around where generosity sits in the hierarchy of Jewish values. And what does it mean to, what are the other ways in addition to Nadiv Lev, uh, in addition to generosity of heart, that the rabbis describe uh, being a generous person. And in Pirkei Avot, we particularly see them describe it as a good eye. When you see something in Pirkei Avot say that he had a good eye, it means that he had a generous eye. And I love that because to me, generosity is not just giving um, kind of wantonly and blindly, but seeing a need and looking to fill it. So there's both the seeing and the intentionality of, you know, there is a role for me here. So I'll invite you to turn to the very last page. Um, this is from Bavli Psota. And Rabbi Yoshua Ben Levi says, uh, one may give a cup of blessing to recite the blessing of Birkat Amazon only to someone with a good eye, a generous person. As it's stated, one who has a good eye will be blessed, Yavorach, for he gives of his bread to the poor. But the Gemara says, do not read Yavorach will be blessed, rather read will bless, Yavarech. And so someone with a good eye both is receiving blessing and is giving blessing of themselves. <laughs>